I like to consider myself an honest man. When I review these movies, I'm telling you the truth. There's video evidence of it. So all that I ask is that the movies are honest with me in return. Like Sharknado. It says right there what you're gonna get. A big storm with sharks in it. Or Texas Chainsaw Massacre. A massacre that takes place in Texas with a chainsaw. Or even Chupacabra vs. the Alamo, in which chupacabras attack the Alamo. Unfortunately, most movies tend to be more deceptive with their titling. Like The Happening. It says it's The Happening, but nothing happens in it. Or, in the case of today's film, The Bloodsucking Pharaohs in Pittsburgh, which has no blood sucking, no pharaohs, and I'm not even sure it takes place in Pittsburgh. Weird flex. This movie, despite the fact that I say this about all of them, is really weird. It had potential. It really did. With a name like that, how could it not? Unfortunately, it fell short in pretty much every area. It's a comedy, but there's not enough humor. It's a horror movie, but it's not really scary. It's supposed to be about Pittsburgh, but there's almost no reference to it. It's like Dead Heat, but done really poorly. The story is also just bizarre, and I don't want to keep you waiting, so let's get into it. It starts out with a shadowy figure taking a walk down Makeout Point. They're dragging some kind of wagon behind them while listening to some tastefully done hanky-panky. Eventually, our mysterious stranger finds a suitable victim, and we see their weapon of choice is a buzzsaw that they have to drag around the battery for. I admire the dedication, but question their choice of weapon. We then see two detectives pull up to the scene, but first stop at a food truck and order burgers. See, this is one of the problems with this movie. There are parts of it, mostly in the first half, that make it seem like Naked Gun or Top Secret or any of those parody movies. But it doesn't keep that tone, so eventually this stuff starts to feel out of place. One of our detectives, Joe Blocker, doesn't want to see the scene, as he has a bit of a weak stomach. However, his partner, Sweeney Birdwell, who I'm guessing is 75, forces him to come take a look. And here we see the best part of the movie, the special effects which were done by the incredibly talented Tom Savini. This poor woman seems to be a little bit of an airhead, and now I understand why the killer went to the trouble of lugging that battery around. Joe loses his lunch, and Sweeney has to pay up, having lost a bet that his partner could keep it together. Sweeney finds a note in the woman's head. She must have had something on her mind. It's written in hieroglyphics. There's also another surreal joke involving music. <laughs> Sweeney and Joe go to talk to a witness, trying to find out what the killer looks like, and there's a joke about hats. No, no, no. <laughs> that's the, that's the, hat. the killer's watching this, but our detectives are too interested in the hats. What a shame. They go to eat and have a friendly chat, otherwise known as an exposition dump. During this, we find out that 1. 22 women have been killed, 2. Somehow Joe has known every one, 3. Joe was involved in a similar case when he lived in Las Vegas, and let's take a look at how he handled it. Very well done, Joe. And four, most importantly, that Joe had a nervous breakdown after that case that led to his wife leaving him and giving him, I quote, a sexual problem. Because of that sex problem. Sweeney, will you shut up? You can't make this stuff up, folks. Sweeney takes Joe home, attempting to talk to him, but mostly just making fun of him. The cares, a home, things that really count. Without those things, my life would be as pathetic and full of emptiness as yours. And we get to see how these two live. Joe is friends with a local street vagrant who chats him up, but he rebuffs her advances and walks up the stairs to his apartment, where he lives alone. Sweeney, meanwhile, pulls up to his house, where the steps are covered in cigarette butts. Typical Pittsburgh problems. This leads to probably my least favorite character in this movie, which is saying something because every character in this is unpleasant. Irma, Sweeney's wife. Her two character traits are being a heavy smoker and jealous. She speaks using one of those microphone throat things and it's like nails on a chalkboard to my ears. Real healthy. Hey, that's you. They have a pretty typical husband and wife conversation where Irma asks if the girl at the crime scene was pretty, and Sweeney responds by telling her that her brain was scooped out like a melon. They're also eating just disgusting health food, like, like worse than the normal stuff. Ugh. It's your breakfast, papaya and pinto beans. Joe, on the other hand, is taking a trip down memory lane by reading an old newspaper where his sexual problem is so well known that the newspaper decided to write about it. Fed up with the world, Joe decides to see what his gun tastes like, but surprise, 
It's a squirt gun, more of that absurdist humor that we've come to tolerate. While this is happening, the vagrant that Joe is friends with finds a new client, but unfortunately, they seem to be into some pretty weird stuff, and use another power tool to spray blood just all over the inside of that windshield. This leads to Joe and Sweeney getting called in for the classic mean police chief scene, taken to a relative extreme when a police chief threatens to murder the two detectives unless they can figure out what's going on, punctuating his rather excellent speech by shooting them. Can it be the lousiest cops on the force? <laughs> this leads Joe to make a call to his former partner, Deke Taylor, who helped him with the case in Las Vegas. Sweeney and Joe part ways for the day, and we're introduced to a subplot that actually matters, kind of, where Irma attempts to break her dependence on smoking. More on that later. We see another young woman who just screams victim, and after some typical setup, we see probably the most creative kill. This woman, who just will not stop talking, ends up on the business end of an industrial grade shop vac, and we find out that her tongue got sucked out. There had to have been a better way to do that. We find Joe being his usual sad sack self, refilling his squirt gun, when a girl runs in to try to stop him. Sweeney interrupts this, and we find out that this is Dee Dee Taylor the daughter of Joe's part. Apparently, Deke is missing, so his Nancy Drew-esque daughter decided to come in his stead to find him. Her character traits are being smart and hiccuping. Also, she's a meter maid. Felt like it warranted mentioning. Joe and Sweeney have no other option, so they take Little Miss Junior Detective to the most recent murder. Checking in with Irma, she's gone to some clinic where they're trying to help her break her addiction. This involves her watching a clip of people dying while smoking, and when she tries to light up, gorillas burst through the wall and spray her with a fire hose. This has absolutely no lead up nor reason for this to happen. There is a payoff to this, but it is incredibly stupid. Back at the crime scene, this plays out much like before, with Joe getting sick at the sight of blood. However, Dee Dee starts putting some clues together and realizes that these murders are not similar to the Las Vegas ones, they're exactly the same. That one involved 29 women biting the bullet, which seems like a lot, and Joe must have been a terrible cop for that to have happened. Dee Dee says that the brother of the guy who committed the murders moved to Pittsburgh a while back so they need to find him. Oh, yeah, this film takes place in Pittsburgh. How could I forget after all the beautiful Pittsburgh scenery they showed us? Sweeney mentions Joe's sexual problem again. The sexual problem. <laughs> and Joe threatens to shoot him with just a fantastic quip from the police chief. Don't hesitate. Don't think about it. Just do it, please. Now, that's leadership. Dee Dee, Joe, and Sweeney get a call to go to the medical examiner's office where Joe is bullied by three people who look like they work in a deli. It's great to see you here, Joe. You gotta come down more often. This is a happy place, isn't it, girl? I also get serious cafeteria worker vibes from these people. They're pretty creepy. They find another note, which Dee Dee can read because she studied hieroglyphics and because they needed to figure out a way to move the plot forward. Joe once again gets sick after a disgusting look at a casserole. It made even my stomach turn. I'm sick now just thinking about it. Intermixed with all of this is scenes of Irma getting cattle prodded by scientists and beat up by a physical therapist to stop smoking. Back at Sweeney's house, the gang is decoding the hieroglyphs and find out that they're related to some formula that can purge a body of sins leading to a perfect afterlife. The killer is using victims to help complete this formula, but I gotta be honest, I, I have no idea what this thing does. Irma walks in and we get the closest thing to a mummy in this film. She also makes more disgusting looking food. I do not like that character. They figure out that the last killer's brother, Jackie Cairo, lives in Pittsburgh's famous Little Egypt district. Yeah, you know, Little Egypt. I love it there. Cairo owns the Cafe Nefertiti, and after a scene that shows you what Little Egypt looks like, they arrive at the cafe. Here we meet Grace, an enthusiastic waitress, Lober, a gross chef, and Jackie Cairo himself and his band of assassins. Like most restaurant owners have. Dee Dee decides to do some undercover work and goes to the Hotel Nefertiti, which is also owned by Cairo. This whole sequence is basically really weird, and for decency's sake, I won't go into it. I may suggest a special device with the No! <laughs> Find yourself the movie if you're that curious, weirdo. Back in Joe's apartment, we see another lady of the night who sees the graffiti on Joe's buzzer that states he has sexual problems. I feel so bad for this guy, he just cannot catch a break. Just like our unfortunate Nightwalker, who's a bit tied up at the moment and meets an untimely end from the business side of a jackhammer. Ouch. This causes Joe and Sweeney to be pulled away from their stakeout, which leads to Dee Dee being kidnapped. This leads to a creepy scene that doesn't even do typical exploitation right, 
and Cairo leaves to go do something with Grace. Joe and Sweeney get into a fight at the crime scene with the police chief, because he thinks Joe may know something about the murders, due to the fact that a parking meter was stuck in the victim, and time is up meter made is scribbled nearby. They argue, and both some mostly random officer and the police chief receive a blow to their manhood. Joe and Sweeney race off to the hotel, then search through the trash to find out where Dee Dee is, because Joe threw the address away. Way to go, Joe. Meanwhile, Dee Dee, dressed like a belly dancer for some reason, breaks free and begins to explore. Also, we find out that Cairo is just a scuzzy photographer, so while he isn't a murderer, he is a creep. He's kidnapped, and around this time we find out who the true villain is. It's Grace! The woman who really wanted to be a waitress and uh, apparently likes cosplaying as Cleopatra. Turns out she's the daughter of the guy who was killed and wants revenge on her uncle, who is Cairo, Dee Dee's dad, who she's keeping in a sarcophagus, and Joe. Meanwhile, Joe and Sweeney arrive and are attacked by bikini assassins, because why not? There's a fight scene, and Irma shows up for some reason, and the three assassins are killed. Back to Dee Dee, who is being tortured because the recipe requires the tears of a virgin taken in sorrow. God, this movie is weird. What follows is another weird scene with Lober, which is just... How did this even get in the movie? What? I can't! You what? I'm trying, I just can't. You make me nervous with that weird costume and You're everything. You're spoiling everything! I need more tears! That's better. Joe and Sweeney arrive, just in time to see what happens if you take a dip in a pool of a warm ketchup, a tomato sauce, Kool-Aid? Take your pick. What follows is likely the goriest thing I've seen in a while. Great effect work by Savini here. Joe gets thrown in, but is saved by the timely arrival of Irma, who Lober mistakes for the god Anubis for some reason. Grace takes Dee Dee in a chainsaw and makes a break for it, but Irma manages to always get ahead of them. She looks so spooky due to her therapy techniques that Grace is actually convinced she's Anubis. That's the payoff. Are you satisfied? Because I'm not. The chase ends in a junkyard, where we get a nice fight scene inside of a trash compactor. Joe comes to the rescue, and we get to see a Grace pancake, which Joe doesn't look away from and causes Sweeney to throw up, showing character growth, character development, I don't know, I never paid attention in English. Thus ends the reign of the blood-sucking pharaohs in Pittsburgh, I guess. This movie could have been great. It could have been another dead heat, but it was too inconsistent, it couldn't pick a tone, and when you boil it down, it was just too freaking weird. Despite my misgivings about this movie, and the fact that the title is super misleading, I do recommend this. There's enough here that it'll keep your interest throughout, despite the fact that most of it is just bonkers. I still can't get over how wrong this movie's title is, though. There's like two references to Pittsburgh in this whole thing, and they're not even obvious. And, and I cannot stress this enough, there are no blood-sucking pharaohs in this! To the person who recommended this, you're a real sicko. That's all for now, thank you for watching, and come back next week when we'll be reviewing a movie where the title can actually serve as a summary. And remember, Weird Flicks watches what no one else will. Thank you.